Okay, so we started Profit First um, with a couple members and they had great success implementing it and made it into a podcast, made it into a YouTube video, decided that since our second quarter was about cash, Profit First would be a good place to talk about cash. Um, so there's no accrual accounting here. There's no gap accounting going on. We're literally talking like that. about, yeah, we're talking liquid. Um, and the, uh, the book itself is, uh, not an easy read. It's, it's a good read. The second half can be technical. Um, uh, Michael Mikowitz, um, did a great webinar, which a number of us joined, uh, last month, followed by the Profit First Book Club, uh, number one. And uh, we got through chapters one through four. We're going to do a quick recap of that. And then we're going to touch on five, six, seven, eight uh, with the, some of the advanced stuff saved for the third session, which hopefully will be in two weeks. So um, with that, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen and go to screen two. Let's see if I can pick this up. So Charlie, can you see um, a full screen? Yeah, you're good. Awesome. All right, so chapters five through eight. Um, this is where we start, the rubber hits the road. We start looking at um, actually the technical approach to profit first. So first book club was about theory. We are gonna touch on theory briefly here and then we're gonna get into how you go forward with it. And it's so funny because you know anybody who first encounters this topic thinks, well, I want to make 10%. I'm going to put 10% away on every sale and voila, I'm doing profit first, right? So, but it's obviously more challenging than that. So we'll walk you through what that challenge is. Um, so review from session one, you might remember that, you know, Michael Mikowitz starts his book by going into the fact that your business is an out of control cash monster. Um, there's comings and goings with your money. And we all know from being in peer groups that whatever your EBITDA is or even your operating profit, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's how much your bank account grew, right? So why is that, number one? And number two, how do I manage for profit? Because we have had a, a decrease in EBITDA an operational profit over the last year. And so might be a good time to start learning these principles and getting it to the next level. So the core principles was the next thing we attacked and uh, I'm gonna step through some of this. So on the business is out of control, um, we realized more sales is not equal to more profit. And we also talked about the survival trap, which I love the story of the guy in the lawnmower and he's the landscaper. And then all of a sudden he's, you know, cleaning up debris, and then he's, you know, helping with roof problems, and he's essentially um, scuttling his main priority of being a landscaper and just adding more revenue because he's in this survival mode, and he's trapped, and he's just rolling through lower priced items. So we see this in the rental industry. Uh, we see it in our business and peer groups where we're chasing the small dollars uh, when we should be focused on who we are and what we're bringing to the table, right? So um, that was a good round table. The principles start with using small plates. So you might remember on this, we were focused on food. And so, you know, we're gonna use small plates because you can use a big plate or a small plate. And what happens is this idea of Parkinson's law where, you know, uh, a, tooth, a, to a tube of toothpaste can last you two weeks when it's full and it can last you two weeks when it's not full. And that just has to do with, a, you know, how much you're squeezing out of the, the toothpaste uh, thing. So this idea of using small plates when you eat, uh, using small plates when you are focusing on your uh, business. Um, we want to serve sequentially. So never, never, never pay your bills first. That's one of the lessons you learn. Uh, you want to be able to pay, um, uh, the apportionments off first. So we'll walk through what those are. Um, you also want to remove temptation. So um, that's the other part is by, um, you know, looking at it from a perspective of the first money goes in these buckets 
it's going to um, make sure that you're being disciplined and you're removing some of the temptation to spend money in, in inappropriate ways, right? And if you're doing this regularly, it's enforcing a rhythm. So they talk about when you physically, and we're going to learn this today, we're going to learn about, you know, the 10th and the 25th of the month. And we're going to allocate during those periods and, you know, put the money on the serving tray, right? And have it go into these bank accounts. So th those were the core principles. Um, we also talked about setting up profit first for your business. And we talked about bank accounts. Um, Michelle, you brought up some great points in that session about, you know, he, it's just limiting. And, you know, they want it to be limiting. When you read the book, they like make it as hard as you possibly can. And, you, you know, both you and I are like, but we kind of like convenience and we like seeing like our ability to transfer funds. And they're saying, don't do that, right? Especially when it comes to some new accounts we're gonna learn about, which are the hold accounts. Um, and then lastly, we go through the assessing of the health of your business. Um, we finished our session one and I immediately went into two days of uh, profit first counseling from a consultant she actually, um, she and I were supposed to meet today, but she had 200 uh, people. So she works for Profit First and she was doing an event for 200 people. Um, but she took one look at my financial structure and she's like, yeah, you got, you got a ways to go on this assessment. So if you guys haven't done the assessment, we have the Profit First Instant Assessment. Everybody who's attending gets a shared drive. Inside the shared drive, there's all these cheat sheets and tools that are available for you to use. Um, this is a link right here. So you'll have uh, inside the Google Drive, you'll have access to this PowerPoint, but you can just click on the link and it'll take you to the assessment, right? And ask you certain questions. Um, I did it for a rental company. So we're gonna talk about that today. So this is where we were supposed to read. So did anybody, first off, and should I keep going like this or do you guys, some of you have read it and you want to like have questions about certain sections? You can speak up. I think you're good. Keep going like this. Yeah. Keep going yeah, like I'm this. Good. All right. I'll, I'll We're not afraid to interrupt you if we have a question. Yes, please do. Thank you. Hey, Dan. Hey. Um, are these slides somewhere? Yeah, the, um, oh, you can't see? I see the slides. I'm just saying, okay. is there some place I can grab them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get a shared uh, folder. So um, Charlie will give you a link and you'll, you'll have these slides. You'll also have all the tools. So anything related to Profit First. Okay. Right. Um, Thanks. Yeah, everybody gets it. So, um, so the first thing is um, he starts chapter five and he does a good job with some of the storytelling in this. Um, he talks about the 80% story. Does anybody remember that story? Michelle, do you remember that story? It was a person who was, at, she was attending a seminar and uh, the speaker was saying, if you do everything I tell you to do, you should be able to close 80% of your customers and, you know, just keep oh, doing this. Is that the one he meant 18%? Uh, yeah. So... <laughs> So the guy said 18% of your customers, but she heard him say 80%. So, you know, she was only doing closing like 10, then she was got to figure out how to close 25, then she figured out how to close 40, you know, and and then she's like, I, she, I got to 75%, but I couldn't get that last 5%. So she finds the speaker and, and of course he tells her, you thought I said 80, I said 18. <laughs> so she clearly was not hampered by uh, anything other than herself, which is the lesson here that um, I was super intimidated when I started this process and uh, my numbers were worse than worse. And, you know, the, the concern is, can you really do this? Like, how does a person go from negatives to positives? You know, how does a person go from small to big? So um, I felt much better after these chapters. So five, six, seven, eight are really good. Um, so number one, don't get bogged in, down in the details. This guy who's an author, he is an 80-20 guy. He talks about Pareto principle in the, the um, book, which is, you know, don't get lost in the, in the de details. Go right into, you know, take the first step and you're halfway there, right? Mm -hmm. 
but also look before you leap. So the other part of this is if you're an optimist, if you are what I call a high eye in um, being in a disc profile, um, you have a tendency to get pretty greedy and pretty aggressive. And he, he's just saying like, there's no reason for that, right? You can, you can take baby steps and a year later, you're gonna look great, right? So just remember that. So a couple of terms we're gonna learn real quickly here. Um, what we're gonna do is we're going to look at your current financials in your business, the rental business, and we are going to um, uh, figure out how do we allocate. So this idea of having a serving plate and taking money coming in from sales and putting it on your serving plate in the form of a couple buckets. One is owner's comp, profit, taxes, and they call it op OPEX, which is operating expense. So current allocation percentages are what's happening on your composite book, right? So I can pull that up and, and show you what that looks like. Uh, profit target allocation is, is the other thing, which is now like, well, what do I want to do? So if this is my current split, what do I want to be for the future? And it's just like a really nice visual cue that says I need, I have a gap here and I need to get there. Um, so this is the target allocation on owner's comp. Um, very important. Um, one of the things that you should know if you listen to the podcast or the YouTube video is Tony Peterson did it. And Tony was not doing 2 million revenue. In fact, I think he was more like a million revenue. And so for him to go through this process and allocate to the owner's comp first, and do all the right things, it was pretty powerful podcast. So um, good one. So that all lines up with don't underpay your most important employee. I'm the type of person that absolutely would, you know, I own body shops and subways and I would always take zero or take nominal money thinking, well, I have equity in the business and that's my value and that's my payback. Well, it's not, it's the, it's the profit and the distributions you draw off the business. So we'll get really focused on that. And then lastly, the tax that's allocated, right? So um, what do we need to put aside for tax purposes? Um, all right, so here's a million dollar rental company. So this is a good place to start. So if you're a $2 million, you can learn from this. What he does in the book is he sees if you're under a million, if you're 250 or 500, this is what you should do. If you're a million or 2 million, this is what you should do. If you're 20, 30 million, this is what you should do. So he, in the book, he does a good job explaining all that. In the rental company, this is these are this is all new. So whatever you I have ever in, interacted with you about with composites, you have to forget about for now. <laughs> so so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the real revenue of a rental company. So um, if you're a million dollar rental company, I will find materials and subcontractors and big one here employee costs. And that will all get scrunched together into materials and subs, they call it. So really, what are we doing here? We're kind of trying to say, well, what's the gross profit or the gross profit revenue that we can count on in this business? Because uh, yeah, we want to be more efficient. And we want that number to go up. But the assumption is, it is where it is. And we're going to manage the piece that is controllable underneath it. So real revenue, and, and again, this might be aggressive. So when we, if anybody wants to do this on their own business, I can help you through it. Um, I think Michelle, you did this, right? Yes, I, I did that. It was very eye-opening. Did you, did you include the employee cost up there? You know, I, I started off including it, but then I got really confused about which tap to use because they have the whole spectrum. So I didn't know whether it was top line revenue, real revenue, and then my percentages were so off. I, I, I got too much into the weeds and that's where I kind of- Yeah, and that's the trick, right? So this, this first piece, chapter five, is really where the rubber hits the road. It's this idea of really understanding your, your numbers. What you're trying to say is what is controllable margin that's being created uh, for the company. So if I'm doing a million in rental, I'm gonna say six, 600,000 is gonna go away. 
It's going to go to all the rental costs. But here's the trick. You have to back out your depreciation. So we put depreciation, amortization, or depreciation interest, all that. We put that up in the cost section. That is being changed next year, FYI, for anybody who's interested. Um, it's going to be put back down where it was, but for now it's there. So what I did to make the 600,000 was I said, okay, what's the gross profit in a million dollar operator? And then I added, I took out of that the uh, depreciation interest and use, use equipment sales, got that out. So when I took that out, it went up. And, but then I, threw in 30% on employee costs. And so when I threw in 30% on employee costs, it went back down. And that's why the real revenues is 400,000. Now, yours might be 500,000, yours might be 550. One of the things I did not do here, which I should do, is I did not remove owner's compensation. But if our assumption is that the owner is fulfilling a general manager role, you can leave him in. Right. So because this idea of owner compensation is not is not a general manager's salary. So if somebody pays themselves three hundred fifty thousand to run a two million dollar operation, then he's really paying himself two fifty to run it. And he's given himself one hundred in owner's comp, which you see right below here, right on this page. So I got four hundred thousand. I am taking fifty thousand in profit based on my history. I look at my net profit. My owner comp above my salary is 50,000. And the taxes I paid um, for the government was 5,000. Now he goes into detail on taxes and he says, it should be your personal tax. It should be every tax that you pay. And so you can absolutely get more aggressive with this. Um, I did not. I said, well, netting out my tax is pretty low. So I'm gonna do this. So what the other piece to this was when I carve out employee costs, my, the rest of my operating expense was only 250 grand for a million dollar rental operation. So what is that? So this is this, um, uh, your, so this, if I looked at caps, remember we talked about caps. So caps is not, there's no column here, but if I took the caps, uh, real revenue or um, profit at, uh, let's see. Yeah, it would be profit at, at $50,000 um, would mean that I would be at 12.5% caps. My current allocation is 12.5%. This is my targeted allocation. So now you can go and lean on Michael Mikowitz or you can talk to us at peer groups and we can walk you through your targeted allocation, right? And so real revenue is what you have to work with. There's no change. But um, when you are looking at real revenue, you, you potentially could get your profit for a million dollars. You could get your profit to 25% of real revenue. Now, what that means is it means it would be doubling your current one of 50 and being able to have 100,000 of profit. Um, what that is, is that's 10% uh, net profit on 1 million sales, right? So you see how kind of how I backed into that number, but it's doable, right? Nobody's gonna argue that you can't make 10 cents on the dollar. Um, your EBITDA might be 30 cents on the dollar, but the, the actual net profit might be 10 cents, right? So. I said 10 cents on the dollar for profit, 10 cents on the dollar for owner, totally fine. That works out to 25% of the real revenue number. So that's, these are my goals, right? So, and then on the tax side, I didn't say any change there just because I didn't want to mess with, I don't want to spend all our time talking about tax goals or anything like that. Um, I will say that, you know, in order for those to grow, Changes have to happen in my operating expenses. And so that means, you know, what's fair? What do I want to see there? I'm identifying a target of 150,000 of operating expense. Now, remember, there's no people cost there. All we're talking about is marketing, professional development, 
education, admin, um, any shop stuff, but not, not rental assets um, and stuff like that. So this is just a very simple assessment plan, right? So now I've, boom, I've gotten this. So has anybody gotten this far or attempted it? So Michelle, you wanna share your story? Yeah, so I, I did get far as far as putting my top line revenue for material and subs. I actually use my cost of goods sold and my employees. So like I put 100% of my um, uh, payroll into there. So my real revenue was super low. And because of that, the um, profit first numbers were really low, um, meaning that my, my change, I needed to increase everything. So um, I think the way that you've done it here and my understanding now is if I do only 30% of, of my payroll and I don't back out, of, and I, I, think I, I think I backed out of my salary and I put all of my salary under the owner compensation. So that actually needed to decrease. But if I, I do what you're doing, my numbers will come out a lot better. Yeah. And, and keep in mind that like, if I'm going to apply this, if I had a million dollar rental company and I'm going to do this, I would actually up on the top of this screen, I would put three-year goal, right? Or, or two-year goal. Like I am, there's no way I'm going to wake up. You can't jump into this, right? So what they recommend you do is really understand your actual data, which is the actual dollars and the cap column, which is not here. Um, really focus on how you're actually and, and buy into it and understand it and then increment it increment it slightly. So whether it's a, you know, I'm going to grow 1% from where I'm currently at, or I'm going to do this, like they want us to make these baby, baby steps so that we can feel good about the progress. Because if I just put this here, and then I look at 90 days from now, uh, there's no way I'm going to hit that number, right? But I, I might still be actual. But hopefully I'll see movement from the actual to the targeted, right? So that would be the plan. So my OPEX has actually greatly improved. And so again, right, that, that principle where um, I thought my OPEX was supposed to be a certain amount. So we've been working off of that budget and we've actually been holding it together for the last couple months, which is amazing. That's, that's so cool. And, and in these chapters, there's a really cool, uh, some cool tools that he described and I'll go over that with you here. So next step, chapter six, we're now putting this profit first into motion. And uh, I don't know if anybody read the book, but there's a great story about uh, Jorge and Jose. They were actually the people who read the toilet paper uh, book that he put out first and, and really keyed in on this profit first element and changed everything about what they were doing and just focused on profit first. And that led to the book profit first. So it was kind of a, a really cool story about how, um, and, and every story he shares, like these people don't go back. Like they put it in place and they stay tight because they just make so much more money like in their pockets. And they, and they show you like what to do after you make the money. I mean, it's just incredible stuff. So it's pretty cool. So day one, what do you do day one? They say, tell your people, I don't really know what that gets you. I read the chapter over and over trying to figure that out. Um, uh, I think like in my case, I would tell Zoe and Charlie and Patrick and you guys would help me um, maybe get there. You know, what'd you do, Michelle? So actually I, I asked some of the longer time employees what my dad would do when he realized that we needed to make more money. And they said that he had this way of get, coming outside of the office and saying things like, hey guys, you know, um, we're, we're doing hamburgers right now, but we need to get to steaks. So, you know, let's work for that steak oh, dinner. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and so that's something that I've been trying to um, create my own method of doing that. And, and you know, it's, it's letting everyone know, hey, you know, we're working on, with a budget now. It doesn't mean that we're in trouble. It just means that we're going to start making more money. And making more money is good. And these are the reasons why it's good. So... That, that's that's kind of what where I'm going with this as far as that's, letting that's great yeah I was trying to think through like what's the best way to do that and make it be meaningful um then you set up your accounts uh so you you set you I know you set up at least one account right 
Okay. I, I was only able to set up those those two accounts because okay. my, my bank won't let me go down to zero without charging me crazy amount of fees. Yeah, there's a couple technical problems with the theory. So we'll have to uh, continue to, you know, talk in a user group format to find ways around it. Um, I actually have um, multiple banks I'm working with, so I can go a couple accounts per bank and use the one bank as a faraway bank, right? So, so this is your current allocate, allocation. Um, that's where you start. You just try to really nail down your current and then start out easy. They actually use an example in this chapter where it's like a 1% increase um, on the good ones. Then you make your first distributions. Did you do any of that yet? So no, uh, but we have been sticking with that budget that we had. So gotcha. I mentioned to you, I actually am putting away about 30%. Wow. So we're getting out of just 70% of cash. Love it. And, and even though I think that's a little bit high, or I'm sorry, a little bit low, uh, based on what I've seen your numbers are, so that the dollar amount is a little low. We've been sticking with it. It's been challenging, but we've been really doing a good job at that. No, that's great. That's keys to start the process, right? And first day celebrate. So they're basically giving you like through the book. And that's why I encourage you to read the book. He takes a great um, amount of time to say, okay, you did this. Good for you. Now go do that, you know, go celebrate or whatever. Um, and that's part of, you know, getting started. Week one is next. So they say this, this is obviously the, the big, you know, you go into this book and there's like three pages dedicated to cutting expense, um, you know, and that's where, you know, this whole thing begins is, is cutting expense. So um, before I ask you, Michelle, um, or anybody else um, about cutting expense, I do want to go over kind of what they recommend you do to help get a beat on that. Um, then for distribution purposes, they say, or allocation purposes, allocate twice monthly. So the 10th and 25th, you know, get your serving plate out, put the money here for the owner, put the money here for tax, put the money here for um, your op expense and that kind of thing. And then you know, like, okay, this is how I'm going to, to pay. And if you're looking at that twice a month, it, it's more the looking at it. For me, it means that you're going to gauge where you're at with it. Like, is it working? Right. So still in, in chapter six, we start getting into um, past the first week, we start looking at quarterly profit distribution. That's really um, a fun chapter. Part of six really talks about like, um, you know, now taking that money and moving it to the next holding account, right? So whether you're holding owner's distribution or income or whether you're holding tax money, which I never do, which I need to start doing. So that's important. Uh, so the hold account is built. Pay your uncle Sam. And then this other element in this chapter focuses on keep stepping. So you make that one move, you go to the next move, um, you know, go from one to three, go from three to 5%, um, try to improve it. So at the end of year one, they want you to start thinking about another bucket for a rainy day fund, really gets, pushes me to the limit, right? Even contemplating that. Um, and then it gets into how profit first becomes part of your rhythm. I can see it like if you did, if you said, I'm going to start today, retro to June one, and I'm going to do this month, you know, what you get to and where it says in the book, it, it's pretty powerful if you can stay the course, right? Um, and then, of course, um, taking action uh, that really is focused on, um, again, what actionable items, whether we're in a user group setting or whether I'm, I'm watching the the YouTube channel around Profit First or hearing different case studies around it, you know, what are ways to continue to hone in on that, to, to be able to move to that next step? So um, destroying your debt is where 
that he starts to talk about how to reduce operating expense, but also eliminate your debt. I'm just gonna make sure it's here. Need to, because I had this broken out. Okay, so this is the idea of crash dieting doesn't work in this case. So if you have credit card debt, if you have any debt that you're trying to pay down, um, and you guys know this from working in peer groups, is you know what are my debt ratios look like? Are they improving or are they getting worse? And what is it? What what is good for rental operation? Right. So there's a little few challenging moments for a rental company uh, when it comes to debt. Um, and depending on the type of debt it's related to rental asset versus something else, you might feel differently about it. Uh, this is an interesting concept. So he writes in this chapter about enjoying saving more than you enjoy spending. Does anybody have any reference to this? Because I do not. <laughs> Charlie, you love saving, right? You're muted. muted there, Charlie. Yeah. You can't unmute. Well, he figures uh, out it. Some... I do. <laughs> no, no, I'm not a good saver. And you see why this worked better after at Weaver's after I left, right? That's true. You know that I didn't think about that. Now that makes total <laughs> sense. So I, mean, um, I, I I can speak to that. I I personally enjoy saving more than I do spending. Like I like don't get me wrong. I spend gobs of money on ridiculous things like everybody else does. But I actively enjoy seeing my bar graph like rise of my my savings and investments accounts. And you know my spending practices are budgeted on a monthly basis, so that. I'm, you know, little alarms go off when my restaurants have been, you know, hit too hard. And, you know, if it's only the 12th, 12th of the month, then I cool the jets a little bit. And nice. That's, all that's, that's, that's the engineer side of you. That's yeah. Right. right. <laughs> all right. So um, there's a section in here about preparing for your worst month, which really focuses on um, understanding what it means to cut costs and to uh, attack debt work with a smaller plate. Um, and so I'm gonna walk you through um, what this looks like. So number one is this concept of debt freeze, which means that um, as you're paying down debt, you have to um, promise not to take on more debt, which is, can be challenging. So um, that, you know, for me, it's about looking at the calendar and understanding uh, what's going on with the business? Is there a need for uh, any investing or is there ways we can get around it? He had, this is where I got into it was this PR and U. So the first thing you're supposed to do, and this is my, my profit first coach was bringing me to this level, this is, or this step next. So you print out a detailed income statement. And you look at every line in that income statement or even the detail under every line. And you say, uh, you either put a P next to it, an R or a U. So every expense item you have, remember this isn't necessarily attacking the employees yet. This is more focusing on unrelated to the employees. Uh, we do get into uh, making your business leaner. So we'll talk about that. But, but profit, you know, what contributes to profit immediately? What can possibly be replaced with something less expensive? So Zoe knows that, you know, she'll, if she had her way, she'd just go, you know, we're going to have Dropbox and we're going to have Zoom and we're going to have all these things and we're going to buy them at the highest level. You know, we're adding all these different tools. Um, we spent a lot of money on biz equity. Uh, we've never thought of having a sponsor for biz equity even though we have all these you know, financial players around us wanting to get to our customers, right? So there's ways we can replace the costs associated with certain pieces of your company. Um, and then unnecessary. So what do we have that just is stupid? This ongoing nagging um, expense that we don't use, right? So if you take the time and you just go through all of them, 
And if you need brainstorming help on it, then by all means, participate, have other people participate in that. But that's really step one. So Michelle, were you able to do any of that with yours or have, is this like a new concept? Yeah, this is this is a totally new concept and trying to first understand what it means b between profit and replace. So mm -hmm. I know you and I had talked about some of my outside services. Now those are replaceable items, right? That I can yeah. try to negotiate a lower cost, which um, I've been trying to do or bid out and look for new services. So, so I have a, a little bit more of a handle on that. The, the profit though, I, I'm a little bit, I'm still not quite sure that so, I understand. So a good example of profit would be, um, let's just take for example, marketing, right? So he would probably look at marketing expenses and say, you know, is there a charitable element going on that's creating an awareness for your company? Is there some general awareness marketing stuff going on? Or do you have very specific um, discounting programs in place or rebate programs? Or are you offering specials? And, and again, if those items, those last items I expressed, those are directly related to profit, right? So from that perspective, you're they're creating a contribution to profit. Um, when I think about this, when it comes to employees, you know, some people are directly related to the rental experience and some people are overhead. And if you were in spring meetings, you heard us talk about fractional this and fractional that and reduce this and reduce that, right? Uh, we see companies that are two, two and a half million and they've got a bookkeeper they're paying for, and they've got an HR person they're paying for, and they've got, you know, some some different administrative staff, <clears throat> or, you know, something that's not necessarily contributing directly to profit, more along the lines of um, creating comfort, and also, um, you know, the behind the scenes um, cleaning up. So it could be the same thing goes for. Um, cost of training, tr cost of any professional services, you know, are you, are you being smart about it, right? So love our vendors, love to see people do culture index. Is culture index um, financially efficient uh, choice of how to use that product or is there another option? So that goes into replace. So profit is, it has an immediate impact. I have an outside salesperson, they pay for themselves immediate profit replace is is there an alternative option available and then the last one is unnecessary which is well we could shut that down let's shut this down for 90 days and see what the impact is um did we need it in the first place you know so so that's that experience and you know i know a lot of people get a little bit of for clint when they start hearing about that but i think it's like let's go through it find out what it is and see if we can work on that OPEX, because that's going to adjust. It, it seems to me most people who do this, they want to get their OPEX expenses down to allow their profit to grow and the owner's comp to grow. It just seem, seems like that's the norm. So yeah, any question, any, any questions or discussion on any of that? Okay. Let's do... Uh, another thing is when you're looking at your PL, um, circle any recurring expense. So if you know that that's a recurring expense that's going to happen next month, circle it, circle, circle it. And I think the expression in this chapter was really to say, um, again, looking at it, PRU, circling recurring expenses, are we lulled into it? Um, one of the big ones for me is in your peer group, if you're lagging the rest of the members on um, expenses, right? So your expenses are a little bit higher. You need to constantly, you know, have a strategy for review. What's going on with my um, liabilities or um, I'm sorry, my insurance coverages? What's happening with my credit card authorizations? How do I know I'm maximizing the opportunity there? Um, so look at the recurring ones where you might've been lulled and, uh, and, and start to look into those a little deeper. Um, when you get 
to your number on your OPEX, you can figure out your nut. Like what is our break even? So we used to talk about break even way back in the day in peer groups. And we kind of stopped talking about it because everybody's doing great. <laughs> no need to look at break even. <clears throat> but as your as your margins fall, as your operating, as your EBITDA percentage falls, as your gross, or we call it real revenue here, as that falls, um, you know, you need to um, determine, well, what kind of top line revenue needs to come through in order for all these pieces to work to hit this number. Um, I can tell you that, you know, we staffed up. Two of the guys are here on this call are involved in sales, but we know that as part of the overhead cost, our, not, our break even went up. So we now are like in a position to say, okay, we're gonna achieve break even in six months time. And at that point, everything's cool again, but we have to see this happen. So that's one of the first things you do when you add an expense or grow your business adding an expense is to refigure out what your nut is to be able to achieve each of those allocations. So if you need any help with that, we can certainly help you do that. This is the build a leaner team thing, which again, a lot of conversation around fractional, a lot of conversation around how to operate differently, um, any efficiencies or if, uh, that you can build into your company from a system standpoint, uh, this is a lot of what EOS is doing. So the people who are implementing EOS, you do kind of see that they're kind of creating a leaner organization especially when they get past year one and they start to look at core processes because the core processes all are about how do I improve this process? How are we measuring the time frame on it, right? So that's something that they identify there. Cut more, stop recurring. So there's, there's a section in there about stopping recurring expense. Um, I think you need to read it like, Chapter seven is a good chapter because it's got a lot of meat in it around this stuff. But more importantly, it also each of these topics brings up more conversation, right? So uh, highly recommend uh, you dig into that uh, chapter pretty well. By the way, this, this section of the book, five through eight, is really the meatiest part of the book. And if you just cut to that, like I, I work with ebooks. So I do Kindle. I cut to the chase and got five to eight. I think the first time I read it, it took an hour. So we're not talking about a long time to get through um, those chapters. And then um, this was an interesting. So when you do this work around your income statement, they really want you to, you know, if you have your targeted allocation piece for OPEX, they want you to work out on your budget to get 10% less than that because they kind of felt like it's going to bleed. So you need to go through this and you need to identify on paper that you're 10% below your target um, because it'll end up being, you know, meeting your target then essentially. So it was an interesting concept. I captured it there. All right. Last chapter, and then we'll have a few minutes to converse. converse. Uh, finding money within your business. So this is uh, chapters not as strong as six and seven, but it was good. Um, this starts out with this concept of money is everywhere. And there was a story about it um, where, uh, I forget the story, but anyway, there's a story in there that you should read. <laughs> and um, it was good. It just kind of was like, oh, you know, oh, okay, we can definitely um, uh, generate some revenue and not have the costs associated with the revenue or something. It was, it was a story around those lines. Um, they talk about digging a well. It's easier than making it rain. So that has to do with, you know, digging a well takes energy and time. But if you go about a step-by-step you'll get water a lot easier than waiting for the rain to just make it happen. Uh, I also see it as like, we've had, it's been raining the last few years, 20% growth, 15% growth. 
no one is looking at their expenses right now. We're kind of like, hey, I need to spend money to grow, right? That's been our mindset. So all we're saying is it's okay to plan growth, but let's let's you know try a new approach and get you know be the sharpest in controlling expense, right? Uh, the profit squeeze. So this one is um, uh, hold on one sec. I had my notes here. So the does anybody know what the profit squeeze is before I look it up here? <laughs> okay, so um, the profit squeeze, if I recall, let me just see if I've got it. Oh yeah, here we go, here we go. So everybody has a personal story um, about the profits, about your profit squeeze. So it has to do with your competitors. Um, you're in different markets. You know, some of you are in the same market, um, but some of you are in different markets. And so your uh, competitors uh, are big boxes who might set their rates differently. You have independents who set the rates differently. Um, what are some of the stories out there? So let's talk about Texas, Kevin. So you're down in College Station. Um, who sets the pace on rates down there? Is it United, Sunbelt? Yeah, probably more Sunbelt. Yeah. And does are the independents chasing those rates or are they kind of holding their line and showing value or? Uh, that's kind of hard to say being I'm the only, only independent. I'm kind of holding my line. Oh, yeah. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've had rate increases. Don't get me wrong. You know, yeah. Just, but um, yeah, we we still we, we still have I still have some work to do on some of them. It's, um, you know, I'll, I'll look and see, but then you turn around next thing, you know, like on an 8k or something like that, you know, some belts dropping their shorts and we would, we won't even rent them for that, you know? Yeah. So, you know, we had one the other day, they were like 1600 a month. I was like, no. <laughs> yep. And depending on the asset and how the assets are used in your market. And I remember uh, being down there with light towers, and different things happening in the marketplace. Um, you know, sometimes it's salad time and you're doing really well around a certain asset category. And then other times it's like, ah, this thing's been bastardized three different ways. We're just yeah. not going to make money. So, so it's understanding that and having, so for me, if you're doing EOS, we would call it IDSing. We would go through this profit squeeze and we'd say, you know, do we understand our category of assets? Are they, you know, from a financial utilization and a uh, time utilization standpoint, what is good for us? What is optimal for us? So that's part of looking at your top real revenue piece, um, because obviously if it takes you, um, if, if you're generating less real revenue because you've had to add additional people and you're making less revenue, um, you have shorter contracts or you have um, smaller dollar contracts, you're going to see that happen. So you need to be like, especially if you're looking at this kind of grid over time, right? So the profit squeeze is different for different people and different markets. And even though you guys are all in rental industry, uh, each of your markets are going to be a little different. So it's kind of like you have to add this element into finding money for your business. So frugality has to become law of the land, you know, ask the question three times before you spend the dollar. Um, it's not fun until it becomes fun. And obviously we're counting on Patrick to spread his, uh, you know, fun of saving to the rest of the peer group member or family because we, we're not, we don't enjoy saving. So, um, and then innovation is the other piece, which is, Again, for those implementing EOS, it might come a little more natural. Um, anybody who's looking at efficiencies in your business, trying to get by without, um, looking at your labor productivity, all those types of things factor into um, ways to find money in the business, chip away at expenses. So it's this idea that, you know, profit first is about allocating it onto the serving plate. But, you know, like owner's expense, um, 
net profit, or I'm sorry, yeah, profit, owners, income, um, taxes, and then OPEX. So you're putting this money on the plate uh, out of your real revenue. Um, but the, the bigger picture behind profit first is, are these elements, you know, chapter six, seven, eight about trying to uh, manage expense. And so it becomes part of your regular day-to-day -day activity. Um, these and the last ones are just some good advice for anybody is, you know, why do you put up with somebody who's costing you so much money? In our case, we have things that make us money and we have things that don't make us money and we still do them. And so we need to think about what that looks like for us and make some changes. Um, and then of course, if something's working, uh, if you have a certain client that is really profitable for you type of client, we see people go hard into landscaping or we see people, you know, pivot in their business and change. Um, one person who's all aerial, you know, pivoted into um, dirt and lost a lot of money. <laughs> so it's kind of like, hey, let's stick with our knitting. Let's just, you know, let's look to geographically expand and continue to be uh, the best at aerial, right? So something like that. So sm sell smarts, the last one, which is, you know, for anybody who's an event rental on this call, I think I saw Tony for a split second. So, you know, this is about understanding job costing and making sure that when you do your deals, you're focusing on generating the most uh, real revenue which is the gross margin. So that's all I have on the, this section of the book. Um, so status report, let's just kind of go around the room. Um, Ryan, oh wait, I see you on. Were you able to read any of the book yet or are you just trying to get a flavor for it? Oh, he just says on mute, I'm not sure. Uh, Ryan or Doug Haas. Doug's on here. Um, no, I have not uh, read any of the book. Okay. Well, there's plenty out there now. You have the first uh, section of the book club has been recorded and you can look at that. Did you see that at all yet? No. Okay, cool. So those are uh, probably step one and two. And um, obviously if you go on Michael Mikowitz's stuff, uh, there's some pieces there. There's also in the shared folder, we have um, uh, a cheat sheet. So definitely take a look at the cheat sheet. It can save you some time uh, trying to understand how to go about the process. Uh, how about Tony, how about you? Did you, have you gotten anywhere with any of this yet? I'm not sure. Is he still on? Uh, yeah, his phone's on. No, Ryan's here. Ryan, how about you? Yeah. Have you, have Hi. you done? Sorry. You, Sorry, no, I had okay. to jump on a call real quick. So. Oh, no problem. <laughs> have you gotten anywhere with Profit First, read the book, or seen anything? Um, I, I read, and I'm on the audio book. I think I read three quarters of it. On oh, the very audiobook. good. Yeah. You're all caught up. We're, Any. Any, yeah. any initial thoughts? Yeah, I was kind of wondering when you're going through your last section, how I could make those into scorecards in regards to the, um, um, what do you call the uh, profit squeeze part? You know, just, just to see what things would be good as a scorecard metric. Sure. As I've noticed, as I'm doing my uh, the EOS, that, you know, some score things that were good in the beginning have become you know, that we don't need them already. And I need to maybe put a different kind of scorecard on there because it's, yes. you know, it's getting managed. So yeah, we, we have not done a round table on EOS in a long time. So we probably are overdue for that. We should probably guys, uh, Patrick and um, Charlie, we should think about doing some EOS round tabling in the summertime, but, um, but you're right. The, the metrics that you track will change in EOS and they should change. They should focus around where you're feeling your focus is going. So for you, um, the question becomes like, especially around the profit squeeze is, um, you know, how, how do I do this? 
So we know that we have members who have gone through their fleet and they've identified um, in that grid that we, I don't know if you remember that, I showed it to you years ago, I think, Ryan, but it was, um, you know, what's, what is highly financial utilization, high financial utilization versus low and mm -hmm. high um, uh, hourly utilization versus low. So if you go high, high, uh, if they're both high financial, high um, uh, mm -hmm. hourly, it becomes a shooting star. And so you want to identify your fleet and say what percentage of your fleet is cash cow, what percent is shooting star, what percentage is, uh, gosh, help me out on that. Patrick, do you remember that grid? It was- Yeah, you had, you had it, right? Yeah, shooting Time star, ca cash cow. There are two other ones. Um, I want to say, what's low, low? one that was like a- um, Oh, the like low, low, you get rid of, but there's names for yeah. each one. Yeah, I don't remember the names. But but what it does, um, so what you would do with that, um, Ryan, is you might say, like, just like we're using this grid here and saying, what's optimal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want my business because, you know, I understand that, you know, there's a mix between a cash cow and mm -hmm. a shooting star, but I certainly don't want those those dogs, right? The ones that are low, low or something that is, um, you know, that I'm going to do marginally well with, I'm doing a mm -hmm. ton of it, but it just economically doesn't make sense, right? Start moving away from that. So it, so we have one operator in the middle in, in, um, in the Midwest who it looks at those as metrics on the EOS. Um, you know, I think he uses 90.io but um, it, there, that's part of it is to say, how do I optimize my real revenue? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have people looking at their average contract size and putting mm -hmm. that on their EOS thing. They're looking sure. at average contract duration and putting that up there. Um, you know, so, so that's on the gross profit side, but then on the, on the other side of controlling costs, you know, I know from our standpoint, I look at labor costs as a percentage of revenue, but now I might look at it as a percentage of real revenue. Just like that initial story where we talked about the woman who was trying to get 80% closing and it was the number they were trying to get to was 18, but she didn't know. I think I'm the same way. If I look at things as a percentage of gross profit um, or as a percentage of real revenue, I think it might push me a little harder on making room for profit, you know, making room for net profit. Um, so yeah, and and what also the other part to that, what you're bringing up is what works for a rental operation. So, you know, some some people approach the rental operation and say, well, the more debt the better because I get a better return. The cost mm -hmm. of money is cheap. My returns higher. So you need to have certain like rules and laws that you're going to abide by it doesn't you know just because it works in one business doesn't work in another like if if you just stop buying assets you know that could kill your business right so um i think that's part of it as well as saying well we're going to use we're going to use these theories to an extent but we know that in the rental industry we got to be here here and here with the um with our debt management so um, can you send me that um, that sheet? Because I I totally forgot about that. So yeah, if you could right. resend me that sheet again. Uh, yeah, you mean the grid? With yeah, the, the grid. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yes, and uh, and I also the reason why that thought about that was I was thinking about the uh, Rouse operational report for peer group members. Like there might be some good stuff in there. Um, I've clicked through it a few times. Um, it's another one that looks at, you know, how am I versus others when it comes to renting the right stuff, right? So I think we need to dig into that one as well. So we'll make sure everybody has all that. What else? Anybody else? Doug, I knew you were on for a second. Oh yeah, we talked already. And um, this is six, seven, oh, six, seven, eight. I think that's Tony, right? No, it's Doug. Oh, okay. 
All right, and Michelle, anything for you? No, but we have a lot to talk about when, um, <laughs> yeah, when we do talk. Absolutely, <laughs> very, for sure. Well, and I've got everybody's email, so I'll send out a link to that, to the Google Drive that has everything in it. And yes. then Dan, if you'll just put today's slides in that folder, then, I'll, then it'll all be there. So this, the ones from the first one are already there. Yeah, so the first one, I'm just gonna delete and put this one up because it has all the, uh, this has all the, all the other ones are in here. Oh, that okay, work. that's one. But yeah, so you go to, gosh, I don't even know how to get out of this, but, but yeah, I'll, um, I'll make you can sure just put you it up there. Then I'll, I'll, once you put it up there, then I'll send out the link and everybody will have it. Okay, perfect. Very cool. All right. Well, well, thanks everybody for joining. And again, this will be recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel at uh, just go on YouTube and look up peer executive groups, profit first. You'll have last time and this time, and then we'll do one in two weeks. Hey, Charlie, okay. Charlie, you have a minute? Yeah, I can stay on. I'll call you. I'll call you in a minute. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right, bye. All right. Cool, everybody. Thanks. Have a good day. Reach out. Bye.